Hello everyone. Today we are going to be talking about typhoid fever, and then actually we are going to talk about the definition, then the causes of the typhoid fever, then the mode of transmission, and then symptoms and complication, then diagnosis and treatment. So actually, what a typhoid fever is is actually a kind of enteric fever. You can call it an enteric fever because when we say enteric fever, another name enteric fever. When we say enteric fever because it is affecting mostly the intestine and uh, the most important complication we have to know about uh, typhoid fever is the effect it is having on the small intestine as the population. So that's why it is even named as uh, the typhoid fever. And in this from the word fever it is having a kind of uh, unique feature of its fever uh, which is the fever is having a kind of very very high fever about 40 degrees centigrade that is 40 degrees Celsius, very very high fever and kind of stepwise it is increasing, increasing the fever. We are going to see the, 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 the how the fever is in the sun and sometimes fat. So actually, for the causes of uh, the typhoid fever, before we uh, go into deep, we dive into the topic, we have to understand the anatomy. For example, this is the esophagus. When we eat food, actually, it goes to the stomach first then to the intestine, the duodenum, then that's it. So this black thing we are seeing in the wall of the intestine, these black things you are seeing, they are there but you cannot see them until you use microscope. They are called pears patches. And these pears patches, they are actually containing uh, macrophages, um, B cell, T lymphocyte, so that's in the immune cells in general, these pears patches. So they are very, very important in fighting the bacteria that we eat in the food because some bacteria, they resist healing by the acid. They cannot be killed by the acid like with salmonella typhi. So that is the one that is causing the the this thing, the the typhoid. So that is it. And what causes this typhoid fever? Of course, that is the etiology. Actually it is a bacteria called salmonella typhi. And another one which is called salmonella para typhi which is also divided into th into three, A, B, and C. But the most important one you have to know is the salmonella type E, that is the S type E. So, and uh, how does this uh, bacteria be transmitted? It is transmitted by a kind of fecal oral route. That is called, that is, that is, a, this is a transmission. Transmission via, trans transmission via fecal, oral root. So when we say fecal oral root, fecal means the tooth, yes. So oral means the mouth, right? So then actually the bacteria is transmitted from the uh, contaminated food. When the food is contaminated or the water we drink is contaminated by this bacteria, then we ingest that kind of food or, uh, or drinks, then this bacteria is a kind of uh, insect, uh, infect our body. That's what we, we call the fecal oral root. So we ingest it. So, how do this uh, bacteria be, uh, get into our food? For example, if the food is contaminated by a person who is having a, ki a kind of the bacteria for many months ago, after he recovered from the typhoid, maybe after he has get treated, he has, get getting, he has been treated with the bio, um, with, uh, from the bacteria, but he is actually having the bacteria in his body. That is, he co that is what he call, uh, is called asymptomatic carrier. That is what we call asymptomatic 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 carrier. Because he has been treated with, from the type of fever and he is now well asymptomatic. That is, he doesn't have symptoms from that asymptomatic. But he is having the bacteria in his body. So this person without knowing cont cont contaminated drinks or the, 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 the food we eat then if we contaminate that, then and we ingest the bacteria, this is the bacteria inside the food and drink, then if we ingest it, then this bacteria will actually come to this uh, GI, because we said that it cannot be killed by the acid of the stomach. So if it, com it comes to this intestine, this is the pH fascist. The macrophages will try to kill that bacteria by ingesting the bacteria. If the macrophage ingests the bacteria, like this, this is the macrophage, ingest the bacteria, so the bacteria can actually cannot be killed by the macrophage either. So what happens is the bacteria will 
now going to be uh, going to proliferate and then reproduce itself many and many bacteria inside this uh, PS patches. Many uh, PS patches are infected by the bacteria. So this bacteria will now after some kind of death like 10 to 14 deaths after like 14 deaths so this bacteria is now ready to get out of the ph passes uh, ph patches that is from the macrophages so by that time this ph patches they are going to be uh, swollen they are going to be very big because they have been infected by the uh of the, by the bacteria so this red uh this thing you are seeing it is denoting the blood vessels they are denoting the, the blood vessels as we have already know that the blood vessels of the intestine they are actually draining their blood to the liver through the portal vein right so this bacteria can enter into the bloodstream that is into the uh, blood vessels then enters into the liver so any blood that is uh, in the liver then can go into the heart right through a hep uh, hepatic vein then to the anterior vena cava then to the heart and then any anything that goes to the heart can be pumped throughout the body right so this is how the bacteria can be actually separate throughout our body because it enters through the bloodstream right so that is it so this is how the bacteria get access or get uh, successful in its transmission throughout our body it actually affect the ps patches first then proliferate inside the macrophages that is it reproduce inside the macrophages then get out and then enters into the bloodstream then go to the liver and then infect the liver because in the liver we are also having the macrophages then also the liver is going to be affected the macrophages of the liver are going to be also affected then the bacteria will reproduce itself inside the macrophages of the liver then the liver will also going to be enlarged since the ps patches are enlarged because they are infected so that is it so now we are going to see uh, the sign and symptoms actually the sign and symptoms so the signs and symptoms of this are uh, almost all infections you can have fever fever right fever and the kind of fever of this uh, infection is very unique because it is a kind of stepwise fever because it is always increasing 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 in stepwise fashion the fever is increasing right unlike in the fever of uh, malaria someone with malaria can have fever and then in the maybe in the in the morning he will be well while in the afternoon the fever will come back but in type of fever the fever is continuous right it's continuous you can see it's continuous fever yeah the fever cannot go away right so he will have abdominal pain because remember it is affecting the abdominal pain remember it's affecting the agi then abdominal pain together with diarrhea diarrhea and constipation he may have diarrhea or constipation so again almost all person all people that are having fever can have headache right so we can see he has having headache so remember that we said that this bacteria can enter into the bloodstream right so when it enters into the bloodstream it affects the liver then it affects the spleen so that is why the person can have a large spleen and a large liver that's what we call hepato spleno megali because the macrophages inside the liver and the macrophages inside the spleen they are affected with the bacteria so now they are going to be bigger and bigger so now that's why the liver that is hepato spleno megali that is the liver and the spleen megali means big they are going to be very very big so what is the consequence of this hepatosis uh, hepato spleno megali when the spleen enlarge to large uh, uh, large size the, the spleen can be having a kind of a condition called hypersplenism hypersplenism that is the spleen will be overactive it the spleen itself we're going to be carrying out the the RBCs, the WBCs, and then the platelet. Yeah, then the spleen will be breaking down these RBCs, our RBCs. It will be breaking down our WBC. It will be breaking down our platelet. So that's the condition called hypersplenism. Anything that may cause the spleen to enlarge, to become big, it may lead to this. That's why the patient of uh, typhoid, if you actually uh, a kind of get a blood count 
you will see that the RBC is having anemia, the WBC are less also, and the platelets, uh, platelets are less. So that is it. So another symptom of the typhoid fever, you may have a kind of some sign called rot spot. Rot spot. They are kind of rashes actually, mostly in the uh, abdomen. So that is it. They are kind of rashes in the and we, we, we may actually see, see see them more in white people. This is a rot spot. They are kind of rashes. Blanchable. They are blanchable purples because if you pinch them, they will disappear. Then in the next um, few seconds they will reappear again. So that's why that's this is a rot spot. Maybe you will see this in white people, white skinned people, not in black. So uh, that's it. So again, we have already uh, see that this um, uh, another consequence is this bacteria can infect our bone marrow. Bone marrow. So if it goes to, to the bone marrow and this bone marrow, it is where the WPC and the platelet are produced and then the RBC rise. So now it will suppress the, the bone marrow. That is, it will suppress and inhibit, that is to stop the bone marrow from producing this kind of cells. So, exacerbating the WBC deficiency and the platelet deficiency and then the RBC. Then, again, it will, uh, a kind of, as a complication, so this is, these are symptoms and signs. So now we are going to have complications. I'm going to see the complications. These are the complications. So, among the complications, the most important complication we have to know, that is, complications mostly arise when an untreated person, you know, when the patient is not treated well. So the complications arise. That is number one, intestinal perforation. Intestinal perforation. Intestinal perforation. It may actually ha get a hole if this in the is the intestine. So actually, it will rupture the intestine, right? And then if it is if it rupture the intestine, then the food particles we eat will be diffusing outside the intestine and then causing a symptom called a uh, uh, kind of disorder called peritonitis because the intestine and whatsoever they are inside the peritoneum right so that there will be going to be infection because in the intestine there are some bacteria right definitely normal flora so when they goes into the peritoneum then they will cause infection of the peritoneum that's inflammation it will cause inflammation that's called peritonitis so that is it then another complication of uh, this is we may have anemia right anemia then another complication of it we may have uh, pneumonia because keep it at the back of your mind any bacteria or anything that may uh, 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 that can enter into the bloodstream can go anywhere in the body right so it can cause pneumonia when it impacts the lungs so that is uh, uh, some comp among the complications then the diagnosis how will you diagnose it any infection if it, if it enters into the bloodstream you can get a blood cultures. You can get the blood sample of the blood, blood cultures, and then stool cultures in his stool. That's in his feces certification, right? Culture also. So again, there is a kind of test that the lab people they are used to they used to do the laboratory uh, science technologies technologies a kind of test called Weidel test. So the wild test in type of fever will definitely be positive. And uh, before you send all this uh, diagnosis procedure to the labs, you have to ensure that you are suspecting a type of fever, right? So the treatment. Mostly the treatment we use fluoroquinolones. Fluoroquinolones. That is, we use again clarithromycin. Or use adithromycin. Adithromycin. So that's it. Then subtraction, you can use subtraction also. Subtraction. So that's it. So this is this other treatment. And uh, the we have to make sure that the bacteria is treated very well. Because if the bacteria is not treated very well, definitely the person can again going to be infected with the uh, with the bacteria so that is called a relapsing fever it can relapse after two to three weeks it can the fever that is the type of fever can come back again that's called relapsing fever so that is it so 
خب دیروز خیلی پولم شده